Now that we've covered the context for Virgil's Aeneid, uh, we can talk about books one through six. Uh, Virgil didn't write the Aeneid uh, from beginning to end. He uh, wrote individual fragments uh, and would revise them, uh, correct them over time. He scouted a lot of the locations that he describes. In fact, uh, the, the entrance to the underworld that he describes in book six was actually based on a place where there was a cave that went to an underground lake called Avernus that hadn't been very well explored at his time. So as far as he was concerned, it, it could be an entrance to the underworld and he actually appeared to have gone there. Uh, but as he was working on these, he did have the opportunity to read them directly for the emperor, Augustus Caesar. Uh, he read books two, four, and six for Augustus. Augustus knew that he was continuing to work on them. But unfortunately, while Virgil was scouting the, some of the locations in Greece, potentially uh, Actium and, and other places that uh, uh, Aeneas and his men uh, occupy or, or pass by uh, throughout the uh, descriptions of their journey from Troy in books two and three, uh, while he was scouting those locations, Virgil uh, contracted a fever or some sort of illness and died. And while he was dying, he uh, instructed his friends, Varius and Tuca, to burn the, Il uh, burn the Aeneid, uh, burn the text, the manuscripts that he'd written. Uh, he apparently didn't feel like it was uh, finished enough to stand on its own, and he didn't want it to, to sort of be half done. Well, it wasn't half done. It was mostly done, and uh, you know, he had completed all 12 books that uh, were apparently all he intended to write. And he just had to finish the poetry. Keep in mind that you know it's written in uh, epic verse, and so the you know each line has to fill uh, a certain uh, pattern, uh, of scansion. And we can tell there are a lot of lines that are left undone, they're left unfinished, uh, and there are some uh, in idiosyncrasies, uh, the same sort we've seen in other texts, uh, typically texts that were redacted, uh, you know, t texts that were compiled from. Uh, oral tradition. But in this we see, or we're going to see that uh, even a work by a single author bef before it's actually completed could have a lot of these uh, redundancies, doublets, inconsistencies, and this sort of thing. But apparently Virgil thought this was, it was just in a, a state of, of disarray that he didn't want anybody to read. Fortunately, uh, the emperor himself, Augustus, seems to have uh, stepped in and, and told Varys Atuka, don't destroy the manuscript, uh, he, he seems to have had them uh, complete it, not to add anything that wasn't already there, but just to fix some of the problems that they saw. Uh, if there was any like small additions that needed to be made. So thankfully, Augustus stepped in, otherwise we would not have had it. But even now when you read through, you may have noticed uh, a few things that didn't quite make sense. You'd read one uh, description of uh, one element uh, in one book and then come to the same description of these events in another book and they didn't quite match up. One of these is the description of Palinurus. That's the uh, pilot of, Ode of Aeneas's ship who in book five, and if you've got the, the Robert Fagel's translation, this is uh, pages 180 to 181. In book five, the very end of book five, we're told that uh, Palinurus uh, is wide awake at night when everyone else on the, the deck is asleep. He's steering the boat. He's very good at this and he knows even though the seas are calm not to trust the weather, not to let his guard down. But this god of sleep comes to him and is continually trying to get him to doze off. When he when the god of sleep first tries to tell Palinurus, just just relax, just trust the this gentle weather, it'll be fine. And Palinurus says, you know, you tell me to forget my sense of the sea. Uh, the pl placid face of the swells, the sleeping breakers, you tell me to put my trust in that, that monster? How could I leave Aeneas prey to lying winds? Uh, and yet, the god with a bow drenched in Lethe's dew and drowsy with all the river sticks' his numbing power shakes it over the pilot's temples left and right, and fight as he does, his swimming eyes fall shut. Just an instant, uh, sleep stole in and left him limp. The god, rearing over him, hurled him into the churning surf, and down he went, head first, wrenching a uh, piece of the rudder off and the tiller too, crying out to his shipmates time and again, no use, as the god himself winging off into thin air. So clearly a god comes in and causes Palinurus to fall asleep just long enough to fall off the side of the boat. He grabs the rudder and instead of breaking his fall, instead of being able to hang on and stay on the boat, the rudder actually comes off with him. That's the version at the end of book five. 
we see Palinurus again in the underworld when uh, Aeneas uh, goes down to the underworld and sees him and asks him specifically, did some god drown you? And uh, Palinurus says, uh, Captain, Anchises' son, talking to Aeneas, Apollo's prophetic cauldron has not failed you. In other words, the uh, prophecy that you know the, the gods would allow the rest of us to get to Italy was true. No god drowned me in open water. No, the rudder I clung to, holding us all on course, my charge, some powerful force ripped it away by chance, and I dragged it down as I dropped headlong too. So he's holding onto the rudder, and the rudder pulls him in, rather than him falling off and trying to grab onto the rudder. And we don't know what that powerful force is, but he, he says specifically it was not a god that did this. That seems to contradict the version in Book 5. Now, maybe he's lying. Maybe he just doesn't want to admit that he uh, became drowsy uh, and fell asleep, and that's why he fell over. Uh, we have to keep this in mind when a character's description of something doesn't match the narrator's. Maybe it's just the character. But it, does seem, it, it doesn't seem like there's a reason for this. It doesn't seem uh, consistent with Palinurus' sort of honest and, and forthright character. Even more conspicuous is the characterization of Helen. Uh, every author who writes about the Trojan War has to deal with how to portray Helen. Was she at fault uh, for the war? Uh, was she complicit in her abduction? Uh, how should Menelaus regard her? How should the Greeks regard her? How should Priam and the Trojans regard her? Well, uh, Virgil has to deal with that as well. And he seems to have been inconsistent uh, at, at whatever time he wrote this passage in Book 2. Uh, line 703 to 727, or if you have the Fagel's translation, it's uh, 94 to 95, versus the characterization he gives in Book 6 when her uh, second husband, at, or third husband, after uh, Paris, uh, after Paris is killed, she's wed by the Trojans to Deiphobus, and Deiphobus's ghost is in the underworld, and he speaks directly to Aeneas and tells him, here's what happens. But these are completely irreconcilable accounts. Um, one is narrated by Aeneas, one is narrated by Deiphobus, but we, there, there's no reason for us to assume that uh, Aeneas would uh, lie or that Deiphobus would lie, or even if Deiphobus did lie, uh, shouldn't Aeneas have known that if Aeneas actually saw Helen while he was making his way out of Troy? He says in Book 2, when he's describing his escape from Troy to Dido, I was the one man left, and I saw her clinging to Vesta's threshold, hiding in silence, tucked away, Helen of Argos. Uh, glare of the fires lit my view as I looked down, scanning the city left and right. There she was, terrified of the Trojans' hate, now that Troy was overpowered. Terrified of the Greeks' revenge, her des deserted husband's rage. That universal fury, a curse to Troy and her native land. And here she lurked, skulking, a thing of loathing, cowering at the altar, Helen. Uh, and so he wants to kill her. He says, you know, my rage flared out. Uh, I wanted to pay Helen back crime for crime. So he is very, he, he condemns Helen. Virgil in both accounts condemns Helen. It acts as if uh, the whole war was her fault. Uh, doesn't seem to give any blame to Paris. But in this description, even though it's still her fault, she is afraid of the Greeks and she's not running out to the Greeks, she's hiding from the Greeks. She's afraid of them and the revenge her husband might take. But then in book six, uh, the account that comes from Deiphobus, uh, what he describes, and he clearly has the, the scars, his ghost has the scars from being mangled uh, when he was being killed. Uh, and he says that, you know, this is my fate at the hands of the Spartan whore. Uh, describing Helen. Uh, look at the souvenirs she left me, in other words, the scars that his ghost still carries. And how we spent that last night, lost in deluded joys, you know. Uh, remember it we must all too well. Uh, well, first of all, this presumes that she wanted to marry Deiphobus. Now, remember whether or not she was complicit in uh, going with Paris when he first took her from Menelaus, from Sparta, uh, took her to Troy. Uh, we read in the Iliad that she did not like Paris. She wanted Menelaus to win, uh, to defeat Paris. And she clearly wanted to be back with the Greeks. But in this case, it seems that Deiphobus is describing her as if she just wanted to marry another Trojan. Uh, and she was completely happy to be given, to pass, being passed from one Trojan to another. And he's, he goes on, When that fatal horse mounted over the steep walls, it weighed belly teeming with infantry and arms, 
She led the Phrygian women round the city, feigning this orgiastic rites of Bacchus, dancing, shrieking. But in their midst, she shook her monstrous torch, a flare from the city heights, a signal to the Greeks. So in other words, the, the Trojan horse is there in the middle of Troy. Uh, they believe the Greeks are gone, but the Greeks are actually in the, the horse. The other ships are waiting to, to come back around and attack during the night. But the Trojans think that they've won, and Helen seems to be in on the, uh, the strategy. She seems to know that the Greeks are in the Trojan horse, although we're not told how she could have known that. And if she knew that, why didn't other Trojans know that? She was in the city of Troy. Who's been passing her information? But somehow she knows, and she carries her torch uh, around the, the Trojan horse, sending some sort of signal to the Greeks inside. And while Deiphobus is laying bone-weary in anguish, uh, buried deep in sleep, a peaceful, sweet, like the peace of death itself, all the while that matchless wife of mine is removing all my weapons from the house, even slipping my trusty sword from under my pillow, she calls Menelaus in and flings the doors wide open, hoping no doubt by this grand gift uh, to him, her lover, to wipe the slate clean of her former wicked ways. Why drag things out? They burst into the bedroom, Ulysses, that rouser of outrage, right beside them, Aeolus's crafty heir. Uh, and he goes on to sort of curse this, uh, this treachery uh, that he sees. But this account of Helen is very different than the account Odi or that uh, Aeneas himself uh, describes. So we could, in our imaginations, reconcile these two. Maybe she went through this phase where she wasn't sure what to do, but uh, it's clear that even before the, the Greeks have come out of the horse, she knows they're there and she's helping. Uh, and once they do come out, then she's directly cooperating. She's leading them to kill Deiphobus. Uh, it would be very hard to reconcile these two things. Maybe somewhere between uh, these, you know, orgiastic rites and carrying the torch and knowing the Greeks were in the, the horse. Somewhere after that, she's now afraid of the Greeks and afraid of the Trojans, and then she once again gets her courage up uh, and uh, calls to Menelaus. Uh, but that would take a lot more explanation. There seems to be, uh, this seems to be a doublet. Uh, the same uh, story told twice, but with differences that let us know uh, the, the, these were not quite reconciled. Um, perhaps Virgil had one idea at one point and then another idea at another point and he forgot to take out one or to edit one to fit the other. But for the most part, the narrative is relatively consistent, uh, consistent within itself, and uh, consistent as a continuation of uh, the story of the Trojan War as Homer and other authors from the epic cycle depicted it. Uh, keep, in, keep in mind that Virgil probably had access to these other uh, elements of the epic cycle. Remember that uh, the Iliad does not describe the uh, Trojan horse, or the use of the Trojan horse, uh, or even the death of Achilles. These things come from the Iliad Micra, the, or the Little Iliad, uh, as well as the Iliopersis, uh, the, the fall of Troy. And Virgil makes reference to multiple elements that were in these two uh, smaller epics, uh, or smaller parts of the epic cycle. Uh, in particular, well, the Trojan horse as well, we get the most complete version uh, that still remains of anything, any literature that we still have available. Uh, that comes from o Aeneas's description in book two of the Aeneid. Uh, this very likely drew from material from the uh, Iliopersis, uh, but he also makes references to other things, such as the uh, Amazon queen that uh, Achilles kills, and we l learn from another character that he was uh, in love with her. Um, uh, references made to her and other things that uh, we know were described in the Iliad Micra and the Iliad Persis, but uh, we don't have those uh, texts themselves. But it seems clear that Virgil had e either these uh, texts or uh, versions of them that uh, were close enough, that, that contained more information than we now have available. And as I mentioned, uh, Virgil died while scouting these locations, so not only was he trying to uh, be as faithful as possible. Uh, that might be the wrong word. Uh, he was making use of these texts uh, and clearly couldn't just diverge from what was known because these texts were very well known. This was, uh, despite the fact that 700 years have passed since Homer's time, uh, the stories of the Trojan War are still probably the best known uh, of any type of literature available uh, to the Romans at, at that time. And he's trying to faithfully integrate those into his uh, ideology of the Roman Empire. By choosing Aeneas as the hero of his epic, uh, Virgil sort of committed himself to uh, integrating this story of the founding of Rome, uh, or the founding of the Roman people, 
with a body of literature and legend, uh, oral tradition that was already there, already well in place. So he wanted to uh, show uh, faithfulness to the, the text, he wanted to show faithfulness to the geography by scouting these sites. Uh, but in choosing Aeneas, he wasn't making a random choice. He wasn't just picking some character that had no traditions, no uh, story uh, around him and just completely uh, fabricating it. Uh, in the part of the Iliad that you read, uh, book five, there is a, a face-off on the battlefield between Diomedes when he is in the midst of his, his kleos, his you know, earning glory on the battlefield with, Ane uh, with Athena helping him uh, just slaughter all the Trojans around him and even uh, defeat uh, the, the god Mars or Ares on the battlefield. Uh, it's at this point that Diomedes almost kills Aeneas and that's the point at which uh, Aphrodite, you know, the Greek uh, name for Venus, uh, who is the mother of Aeneas, uh, she tries to intervene. She tries to protect Aeneas from being killed by Diomedes and Diomedes directly strikes her, cuts her hand, and then she flees the battlefield, goes back to Olympus, and Apollo actually picks up uh, Aeneas. Uh, you know, the, the language describes um, uh, Aphrodite is actually dropping her son, uh, Aeneas, she was trying to rescue him, uh, and leaving him to be picked up by Apollo and rescued. But either way, in book five, uh, Aeneas is rescued from uh, uh, Diomedes. And again, in book 20 of the Iliad, uh, we have uh, the god Poseidon, who is the Roman Neptune, or the, the Greek name for the Roman Neptune, uh, rescues him on the battlefield when it's Achilles this time that's about to kill him. Now, this could potentially also be a doublet. This, there could be various traditions about Aeneas being rescued by some god on the battlefield, and now it just so happens we have two. Uh, two versions show up at different points in the Iliad. But in book 20 of the Iliad, uh, we're told the son of Peleus would have had Aeneas's life, so Achilles would have killed Aeneas, his sword so near about to strike, if Poseidon, the earth shaker, had not been watching. He spoke to the gods quickly, saying, Now I fear for the brave Aeneas, who will descend to the halls of Hades, slain by that son of Peleus, simply for listening foolishly to the far striker's words uh, to Apollo. Apollo would not save him from destruction. Why should an innocent man, who always makes fine offerings to us, rulers of the heavens, suffer harm because of another's quarrel? Uh, let us rescue him and avoid Zeus's anger, uh, where Achilles to kill him. For Aeneas is destined to live on so that Dardanus's race itself might survive. In other words, uh, Dardanus is the uh, ancestor of all the Trojans, and Aeneas is destined. There is, uh, Poseidon knows this uh, fate that Aeneas has to found another uh, place, another uh, people somewhere else, so that the Trojans can go on. And he says, the son of Cronus, Zeus, has come to hate Priam's line, and mighty Aeneas will be the Trojan king as his descendants in time to come. Uh, it was Oxide Queen Hera who answered him, uh, who replied to uh, Poseidon. Earthshaker, you must choose whether to rescue him or let him die, brave though he is at the hands of Achilles, Peleus' son. Pallas Athena and I have always sworn before you all never to save the Trojans from evil, not even when all Troy burns, consumed by blazing fire, like uh, fire those warlike sons of Achaea will light within. On hearing this, Poseidon, the earth shaker, plunged through the midst of the battle and the hail of spears toward the space where Aeneas and Achilles fought. In a moment he veiled Achilles' eyes in mist, plucked the ash spear shod with bronze from brave Aeneas' uh, pierced shield, and set it down at Achilles' feet, then lifted Aeneas and swung him into the air, high over the ranks of warriors and lines of chariots, so that with the power of the god's hand he came to earth on the far edge of the field. Then Poseidon, the earth shaker, at his side, spoke to him with winged words and said, when Achilles meets his fate, when he is dead, then fight courageously at the front, for no other Greek can kill you. Uh, so in other words, once both Hector and uh, Achilles are, are dead, then uh, Aeneas will not have uh, the, the same sort of match on the battlefield. Two important things to notice. Remember that in the Aeneid, in book two, when uh, Aeneas is describing uh, his flight from Troy. He wants to stay and fight the Greeks, but it's only when his mother Venus shows him the gods at work destroying the walls uh, of Troy. that He sees that the gods themselves, it's not just the Greeks that are uh, destroying the city, but the gods, including Poseidon, or uh, Neptune. Uh, Neptune is actually, with his trident, shaking down the walls, destroying the walls. Uh, remember that uh, when I described the, the background of the Iliad, that the around 1250 BCE, the city of Ilium, uh, 
in the Troad, the, the model for the city of Troy, was destroyed not by an invasion, but by an earthquake. Uh, a few decades later, it would be de destroyed by an invasion. That's when we have the arrowheads and the, uh, the ashes from fires. But uh, this, at one point at least, walls of the actual historical city of Troy were destroyed by earthquake. And Poseidon, Neptune, is not only the god of the sea, he's also described as the earth shaker. So this interaction between uh, Poseidon uh, interacting on, on the battlefield uh, by uh, sort of throwing up this mist, you know, could be some sort of uh, uh, narrativized uh, memory of that. And secondly, the, f the most important part for Virgil here is this prophecy, for Aeneas is destined to live on so that Dardanus' race itself might survive. Uh, there were several accounts of Aeneas going somewhere uh, to the west in the Mediterranean and founding a new city. And these aren't always Rome or even the, the people who will eventually become the Romans. Uh, there is a city very close to Troy called Aeneadae, or in your book is Aeneas. Uh, that city was named after Aeneas. It was described as being the city that he founded. But clearly, if you're Virgil, you don't want that to be the only one. You want Aeneas to keep moving and make his way to Rome. He then founds a city uh, on the island of Crete called Pergamum. And this could be confusing because Pergamum was actually already a city uh, at the, the time of the Trojan War, but also at Virgil's time, and you can still see the ruins of it today, that is not on Crete. It's actually uh, in Asia Minor, in modern day Turkey. And you can visit the Roman remains there. There was a, an entire Roman city. Uh, in fact, that was one of the first places in the Eastern Mediterranean that uh, willfully came under the, the Roman Empire's uh, control. Aeneas comes to Crete, uh, which had been an empire even before the actual Trojan War. The uh, the Minoan Empire had been uh, established there at the uh, its capital of the city of Gnosis. Uh, but according to Virgil, uh, Aeneas comes to Crete, founds a second city, this one named after a Trojan city. Uh, but again, this is not where he's supposed to remain. Uh, they find that out when there's a plague. So he can't stay at Aeneadae because uh, that's when he comes across the tree that he tries to uproot and he finds that there's a Trojan who's been killed with spears and his body's still underneath this tree and these spears grew into this tree but th he tells him you, you cannot stay here, you cannot uh, settle here, this is not the empire you're supposed to found. He goes to Crete and then there's a plague and they uh, have to get uh, an oracle to explain what's going on and again the oracle says this is not the empire you're supposed to found, you need to keep m moving west. And this becomes a common theme. Uh, so this is one of those situations that works well for the, the author's goal. Uh, and he's able to deal with uh, elements of the story that he has to account for, he has to incorporate. He can't just dismiss, he can't just forget, but he wants to change. He doesn't want Aeneas to stop uh, as the, uh, stop with the founding of Aeneadae. He doesn't want him to stop with the founding of this Pergamum on Crete. Uh, he needs to keep him moving. And this actually becomes one of the themes of the entire epic, or at least the first six books. Uh, Aeneas has to pursue this fate. He can't do the easy thing. He can't do the convenient thing. Uh, or, you know, not that founding a city would be easy or convenient. But he has to keep moving in order to, he is bound by this fate, and he is duty bound. He is, uh, uh, I'll describe in a minute, this is his pietas. But this has to be established by the time he gets to Carthage, because when he gets to Carthage, this is the ultimate temptation. He could just stay there and become king of Carthage by marrying Dido, but we've already established that the gods want him to keep moving until he gets to Latium, Latium uh, where the Latins live. That's where eventually Rome is going to be founded. So by choosing this character that already existed, existed in the Iliad, existed in oral tradition as the founder who came from Troy and founded some other city, uh, Virgil is picking up a lot of authorial responsibility, things he has to account for. He can't just presume you don't know anything about uh, these, these other uh, versions of the story. Uh, he is uh, picking up this character that we know uh, is the, the son of Venus or Aphrodite. Uh, his, he's most famously uh, remembered as carrying his father on his shoulders out of the burning city of Troy. There are representations of this in art on uh, paintings on vases and, uh, and coins and this sort of thing, centuries before Virgil's time. So we know Aeneas was already known 
uh, for this act of, uh, of heroism of, and of uh, duty to his father, that he wouldn't leave his father behind. He picked him up and carried him out on his shoulders. And his father is carrying the, the family gods, the penates, uh, these household gods or these local family gods that are not any of the big gods like Zeus, Jupiter, or Aphrodite, uh, Venus, or uh, Minerva, Athena. Uh, they're not the, the major sort of worldly g or gods of the whole world. They're these gods that are uh, deeply connected to this family line. And so he has to rescue, he can't leave these behind. He has to rescue these penates, these household gods or the, the statues of them. So this image of Aeneas carrying his father and his father carrying the penates uh, was already established. It was already the symbol of uh, this noble act, uh, even at the destruction of Troy. And that passage I read from the Iliad also established Juno's contempt for the Trojans, all the Trojans. She doesn't seem to have anything particular against uh, Aeneas at this point in the Iliad, but clearly she will uh, have a, a grudge against Aeneas in uh, Virgil's Aeneid. Uh, uh, and also the figure of Dido. Uh, Aeneas, uh, Virgil did not invent the character of Dido. The, there was already uh, a story about this woman who came from Tyre uh, in Phoenicia and had to escape her brother uh, and in escaping her brother founded this new colony on North Africa and had to do it by, there's the, the legend that uh, she made a deal with the, uh, the, the African king Iribus that uh, she would take over the amount of land that she could cover with an ox hide and she cuts this ox hide into really thin strips to where she can uh, mark out uh, an area big enough for a city. And the city actually becomes very prosperous but when faced with the uh, requirement of marrying Iribus, she actually kills herself. Uh, she puts together this um, uh, sacrificial pyre, and as she's sacrificing these animal sacrifices, she actually uh, uh, kills herself uh, with a sword and then falls on the pyre. But uh, and connecting her with Aeneas is something that is original to Virgil, that uh, Virgil was the first apparently to do that. And not only does Virgil inherit these story elements, he also adapts some of the narrative style and uh, narrative choices that Homer has already established and, and been praised for by uh, past uh, literary commentators, including Aristotle. Uh, remember that the Iliad starts in the middle of things and not chronologically in the middle, it's actually uh, very close to the end of the Trojan War, uh, a 10 year war. So too, the Odyssey begins very close to the end of Odysseus's wanderings, but he stops it uh, in, in book nine and begins to uh, describe what has happened uh, chronologically in the past. In the story past, uh, we have uh, coming uh, one quarter of the way through the narrative. That narrative structure you probably noticed also happens obviously in the Aeneid, where Book one establishes Aeneas's landing on the shore of Carthage and he's making his way to Dido's palace. But then in books two and three, he stops to catch us up. Uh, he's you know telling his story to Dido, but uh, in the narrative, he's actually catching up the readers of Virgil's uh, Aeneid with what has happened, what wanderings he's been through up to that point. And you probably notice, especially if you've read uh, the books nine through 12 of the Odyssey, uh, a lot of familiar characters. We again have uh, the reference to Scylla and Charybdis. We have uh, Aeneas landing at the location of Polyphemus. And not only that, but he lands uh, near the home of Polyphemus after Polyphemus has been blinded. And one of the Greeks, one of uh, Odysseus's or Ulysses' uh, sailors has been left behind. And even though he realizes that the Trojans are his old enemies, he'd rather they kill him than uh, that he be killed by Polyphemus. So Aeneas is literally following in Odysseus's or Ulysses' footsteps. But even before that, even before book two, you probably notice some familiar story elements uh, added from in, in book one. In book one of the Aeneid, notice Aeneas is driven onto this foreign shore. Uh, he meets a goddess that's disguised as a young girl on the coast who then gives him instructions. Uh, he travels to this court while he's wrapped in this shroud of, of mist uh, so that no one can see him. 
And uh, when he's revealed, when that mist is taken away, he introduces himself to the queen. He's made to look like a god. You know, his mother, uh, Venus, makes him look like a god. Uh, and he's welcome to this uh, royal court. Uh, he sees a depiction of the story of the Trojan War. In his case, it's, he sees a mural uh, depicting the, the battles on the Trojan War, and seeing that makes him cry. Um, you know, he says, you know, even at this other end of the world, our sorrows are known. Uh, and then he goes on to give the, his own narrative within the narrative uh, in which his ships are lost in a storm after his, his household gods appear in a dream. Uh, the Trojans try to settle uh, at one place and another than another. His men kill the cattle of the harpies, uh, just as in the uh, Odyssey, uh, Odysseus' men kill the cattle of the sun. Uh, he ends up with Polyphemus and the Cyclops. And after he tells his uh, story, uh, he is tempted to remain and to be married to this queen and to you know, stay at this place and to uh, you know, be a king. These same elements we saw Odysseus uh, confronted with in books five through eight of the Odyssey. Uh, Odysseus washed up on the shore of the Phaeacians. Uh, he meets Athena in disguise. And when he makes his way back, he's covered in a shroud of, of mist so that no one can see him. Uh, Athena is sort of keeping him hidden. But then when that mist is taken away, he looks like a god. He doesn't look like this vagrant that just washed up on the shore. Uh, he then narrates his own accounts of his journeys in which his ships are lost in a storm, started by Athena, and his men are tempted to settle in the land of the Lotus Eaters. And, you know, he has the interaction with Polyphemus, the Cyclops. Uh, he sails between Scylla and Charybdis. Uh, his men kill the cattle of the sun god Helios. And after he tells his story, uh, Alcinous, the father of Nausicaa, the king of the Phaeacians, uh, notes that his daughter is ready to be married and Odysseus would be a great uh, Phaeacian. It would be great you know, for him to marry Nausicaa and, and, and be uh, Phaeacian royalty at that point. So he, Odysseus is tempted to remain there on the, the island of the uh, Phaeacians, but uh, he's he wants to get home. He has to sort of force himself and, and tell his host, uh, I appreciate this author offer, but I really have to go home to Ithaca. Similarly, uh, Aeneas is being tempted to stop in Carthage to settle down, but he knows he is duty bound to go on and found uh, this, uh, this new people. So for all of this similarity, uh, the similarity has a point, and we don't want to fall into the easy generalization, oversimplification, and say that uh, Virgil is just copying Homer, uh, that he's just retelling Homer, because he's not. He's going to uh, tell a very different, he's gonna, it's gonna be a very different narrative, even the elements that uh, involve the same story. So if we were just to say that Virgil copied Homer, we'd overlook 90% of the epic. Uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey, as they've been handed down, or as they had been handed down to Virgil's time, are significant enough elements of the cultural context that Virgil can't simply overlook them. Uh, he has to pay homage to Homer before he can build on Homer and what Homer has is, is written. Uh, this is different than we may be used to. Uh, in the mo modern Hollywood uh, writing practices, uh, modern movies, uh, screenwriters usually presume the majority of their audience is completely ignorant of whatever they're uh, adapting, the Iliad or the Odyssey or any other work of literature that the screenwriters are pillaging for this content. Uh, these Hollywood ad adaptations are almost never actually adaptations. They just start with a blank slate and try to start from scratch with nothing more than a few familiar names. But Virgil can't do that. He, he knows that his audience knows these stories. He has to pay his debt to Homer. He has to make his debt to Homer explicit. Uh, he has to pay homage to Homer and to the other authors of the epic cycle and to the oral tradition. Uh, that's there, and only then can he begin to add to the uniquely Roman elements, narrative elements of this pre-existing story. Once we use these parallels between the Odyssey and the Iliad and the Aeneid to show that he has paid homage to Homer, then we see what he has built on top of that framework. Those similarities are just the scaffolding that allow Virgil to build this very uniquely Roman epic. The first and most obvious and most consistent theme that is a departure from the Homeric epics is this theme of pietas. Uh, pietas is this uh, Latin word that's frequently used to describe Aeneas. And in your reading, in the Fagel's translation, it's usually uh, 
you'll see the words Aeneas duty bound or duty bound Aeneas or Aeneas heedful of his duty or something uh, to this effect. And that's translation of this very common uh, adjective pius. Uh, it's, it's usually pius Aeneas. Uh, Aeneas who has pietas. Now pietas is the uh, origin of our word uh, piety. Uh, if you're pious, that means you are devoted to God or devoted to religious uh, and spiritual concerns. But that's not exactly what pietas originally meant. There was pietas which was devotion to the gods or showing proper uh, respect to the gods. Uh, but there was also part of pietas was respect to uh, your parents, to your children, to your relatives, to your country, to benefactors, people who have helped you in the past. Uh, this is a sense of duty or dutifulness, uh, loyalty, patriotism, uh, loyalty to family and uh, patriotism. It's the sort of thing we uh, in, in America typically describe as you know God, family, country, this, this list of uh, duties in, in a particular order. Uh, this was pietas, this was uh, to whom you owed what and in what order you owed them. Uh, and part connected to that was a sense of justice, a sense of gentleness or kindness or compassion. Uh, but these things were not considered different things. They were all part of the same virtue, this virtue of pietas. And the image that comes down to us and actually came down to Virgil, this image of Aeneas carrying his father Anchises on his shoulders, uh, while Anchises carried the, the family gods, the, the Penates, and uh, at the same time leading his son Ascanius by the hand, uh, this was the image of Pietas. He's, his duty is first to his father, uh, second to his son, uh, well, and his father you know, is the, the holder of the family's traditions, literally the holder of the Penates, these gods of the family tradition, of the family heritage. And of course the next generation has to walk on his own two feet, but he's being led by the uh, uh, example of his father. And this is why we have this description of this event in book two of the Aeneid. You may be wondering if you have the paperback version of the Penguin Classics, the Robert Fagel's uh, translation. Uh, you may see that Creusa is actually walking in front of uh, Aeneas and uh, while he's carrying Anchises and, and leading Ascanius. Uh, that is because, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, Virgil added the fact that Creusa gets left behind in Troy uh, because he has the goal, he needs to get rid of her in order to have Aeneas uh, marry a, a Latin princess and become uh, the founder of uh, the Latin people of, of Rome. But uh, it was clear that in the, some of the older uh, artistic representations that Creusa is actually part of the, the, the family of Pietas. He's, she is someone to whom Aeneas is also responsible for. Although she does tend to be walking on her own. So, you know, he's carrying his father, leading his son by the hand, uh, but Creusa is just sort of there uh, trying to keep up. And this focus on duty, on obedience, uh, to a certain uh, world order, uh, an, an unshakable world order, a world order that has to be upheld no matter what, even if the whole city is being destroyed around you, uh, bears some resemblance to this psychology of authoritarianism that I mentioned before when I discussed Hesiod. Uh, there is this belief in this uh, universal world order that is, uh, is governed by fate. You can't change your fate and yet somehow you're supposed to do something to go along with it. Uh, there is a, a very strict hierarchy with you know Zeus at the top, and you know Juno cannot overrule Jupiter, uh, Hera cannot overrule Zeus, uh, but she can sort of influence those below her on this hierarchy. And wherever you are on that hierarchy, you you owe obedience to those above you, but then you can uh, demand obedience from those that are below you. Uh, other characteristics of, of authoritarian of authoritarianism tend to be uh, loyalty to the tribe, to the group you know that you're a part of above all other things. Uh, and we see that Aeneas is definitely obedient to Troy. He's not going to uh, save his father and son at the expense of leaving his countrymen behind. Uh, he wants to continue to go back into the city and fight Greeks as long as he possibly can until Venus shows him that the gods are uh, have, have ruled that Troy is going to fall. And so part of his uh, Pietas is obeying that decision, uh, recognizing that the gods have decided Troy's going to fall, so there's nothing he can do. He, he cannot oppose the will of the gods. 
Uh, there's also these other elements like the militarism, uh, the sort of you know who you are is determined by who you're willing to kill and what you're willing to risk uh, in uh, direct violent conflict. Uh, also, there's uh, heavy sexism, uh, and we saw this very explicit in Hesiod, where he, Hesiod just goes off on a rant about how you know women are uh, you know a, a curse that was sent to humanity as a punishment from the gods. We don't see that level of sexism, obviously, in Virgil. He's very sympathetic toward Dido. He describes her always as infelix Dido, as tragic Dido, uh, as if what's happening is not her fault. But notice there are no female characters who show pietas, uh, who, who are able to you know, show it in the, in the face of uh, passions. Uh, all the female characters in Virgil are still uh, more subject to their own individual passions than, than are the men. Uh, and that includes Venus. Venus is, though she's the mother of Aeneas, uh, she's acting not necessarily out of this larger, grander, noble piety, but uh, acting out of you know love, a mother's love for her son. Uh, so not exactly the same sort of uh, level of pietas. So uh, the, the women are not as uh, not portrayed negatively the way they were in Hesiod, but not portrayed as positive as the men are either. And I contrasted Hesiod's authoritarianism with Aeschylus's philosophical inquiry. Uh, and, and I noted that the opposite of authoritarianism is not anti-authoritarianism, uh, because that tends to be just a, a, re a rejection of the particular authority. Um, you know, you, uh, someone who wants to be the authority and have that, that system, that hierarchy stay in place, they just want to be a higher part of that hierarchy. That's not uh, the same thing. But philosophical inquiry is when you open up uh, for discussion, for analysis, uh, examination, critical examination of this hierarchy and of the assumptions of you know what makes a group a group and whether or not you owe loyalty to them or to someone else or uh, everything is open to question and that's something that authoritarians do not like. Uh, but we'll see that both of these two types of psychologies are coming together in Virgil because both of these two psychologies are coming together in Rome at this time, or rather there's this constant back and forth between sort of philosophical inquiry, which is connected to artistic inquiry, which is connected to uh, this sort of egalitarian uh, view of the world where the Romans feel like, see themselves as the protectors of, um, of peace and of justice in, in other countries uh, beyond their own. And then that will be replaced by this uh, imperial, uh, imperious, uh, authoritarianism where uh, the emperor is supreme in Rome and he can use his authority to have you know things his way within Rome and then the Rome uh, the Romans can then exert authority over all of their colonies and so there's this great gigantic the whole earth is a giant hierarchy in which everyone has their place and they're not supposed to question that so there is a back and forth with this and this is especially prominent throughout Roman history uh, I mentioned specifically the, the fact that it was when Julius Caesar began to act as, uh, well, he actually was a dictator, although that term meant something different at that time. That just meant he was the speaker. Uh, terms like dictator and emperor and prince, uh, which comes from the word princips, which is the first, meaning the first citizen. Uh, these are terms taken by either Julius Caesar or Augustus Caesar uh, because they did not want to use words like the word for king, rex, or regis. Uh, because the Romans had this long history of uh, up until 509 BCE, uh, Rome was a, a monarchy. And the last monarchs were the Tarquins. There was a king named Tarquinus Superbus, which means uh, Tarquinus the arrogant, the abusive. And because of the things that he did, he provoked such anger in his subjects that he was assassinated. Uh, he was also assassinated with by a guy named Brutus or with the uh, the backing of a guy named Brutus just like later Julius Caesar would be. But from 509 BCE to the death of Julius Caesar in 44 BCE, uh, and if we you know carry that up to the uh, accession of uh, Octavian to the uh, role of emperor, we've got about 500 years of the Roman Republic which is especially hostile to the very notion of a king, of somebody who takes individual power uh, and exercises arbitrary power over the, the people uh, without being a servant of the people and without the Senate expressing the will of the people. So Rome was frequently 
described uh, and you'll see, even to this day, if you go to the city of Rome, you'll see uh, manhole covers and other public works that have the letters SPQR on them. And that stood for Senatus Populusque Romanos. And that meant literally the Senate and the people of Rome. So the Senate and the people were reminders that this was a republic, not a monarchy. So by the time Julius Caesar basically carries out uh, uh, a military coup against the Senate, by leading his legions across the Rubicon into Rome, uh, he names himself dictator because that word didn't have the negative connotations it has now. It just meant that he was the speaker. You know, you dictate or take dictation. Uh, that is, you speak. Uh, but uh, the implication, it, 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 he was king in all but name, and that's what Brutus and Cassius and, and the other conspirators uh, were afraid of. But his assassination clearly didn't stop that uh, authoritarianism from taking over Rome and taking over the larger empire. Uh, but even when Augustus made himself the first emperor, he takes on this title of emperor, in other words, I'm going to uh, preside over the rest of the empire, not necessarily the Senate and the people of Rome. Uh, although, of course, he did, he just didn't want to make that too obvious. Uh, he described himself as princeps, or prince, this is where we get the word prince, uh, as the first citizen, not somebody who is uh, has this arbitrary power over other people, although of course he did uh, in, in action, if not in name. So to understand Pietas, we're talking about a type of authoritarianism that is going to become the rule now that Augustus has become emperor. And Virgil is clearly accepting this, adapting it, even praising it. But he can't bring himself to acknowledge that uh, in such a blunt way as Hesiod did, or as Kratos, power, the, the embodiment of power did in Aeschylus' play, Prometheus Bound, where he says, no one is free but Zeus. Uh, he can't bring himself to say, just obey the powerful because they'll hurt you if you don't. Um, he is living in this civilization that prizes individual autonomy, that prizes civic responsibility from everyone, including those with the most power. So how is Virgil going to accommodate this imperial uh, hierarchy that he's a part of, especially when he's reading these books directly to the emperor himself. He's reading these to Augustus Caesar. Uh, he has to uh, make this obedience to authority a virtue, but at the same time not call it just obedience to authority. So this becomes a type of philosophical authoritarianism. Authoritarianism that sets rules out, it tries to follow a social contract where we at least agree to these uh, virtues, that these virtues make you a better citizen than the alternative. And that alternative is something that Virgil directly uh, portrays in the Greek account. Uh, remember that term matis uh, that I discussed in, uh, in discussing the Odyssey. In the Odyssey, Odysseus lies a lot, and that is a good thing, that's how he gets away with it, and we as the audience in Homer's time would see that and say, oh, that was clever, that was crafty Odysseus, that was Odysseus Polymetis, who's able to weave uh, these uh, strategies together, who's able to navigate this web of, of problems and come up with clever solutions, rather than using brute force to try to uh, hammer his way through a, a difficult situation. This virtue in Homer becomes the primary vice, or one of the two primary vices in uh, Virgil's uh, depiction of Aeneas's journeys. So for all of those similarities between Aeneas's journey and Odysseus's journey, uh, Aeneas is literally following Ulysses, Odysseus, uh, in Ulysses' footsteps, but he, by contrast, by setting up that, that parallel, we see a definite contrast between the way Virgil sees Odysseus and, or Ulysses and his virtue of Metis uh, versus how he sees Aeneas and the virtue of Pietas. Uh, so one example is when Aeneas shows up on the island of the, the Cyclops, uh, he sees one of Odysseus' men who has been left behind. And that indicates to us that Odysseus failed his duty to his own men. He failed to be sure that he had a, his, all of his men on the ship. He, he left a man behind, and that was a failure of Pietas, although it was Odysseus being true to himself. Uh, and Odysseus is consistently described by the narrator and by characters throughout the uh, Aeneid uh, as uh, 
heartless Ulysses or iron-hearted Ulysses or deceptive, deceitful Ulysses. All these uh, variations on what had been a virtue in Homer is now a vice in Virgil. And the ultimate manifestation of this is the Trojan horse. Just as the Trojan horse was you know, this thing that uh, it made Odysseus cry when he heard uh, Demodocus sing uh, about the, the Trojan horse, uh, that's when he says, you know, I am Odysseus, my Kleos has reached the heavens, uh, because that story of the Trojan horse was uh, his reminder that he was Odysseus Palumetis, you know, uh, a multifaceted uh, weaver of strategies Odysseus. Uh, now, that same action, the, the strategy of the Trojan horse in Virgil is the ultimate deception, and it shows the difference between the honest Trojans and the dece deceitful Greeks. So on pages 77 through 81, this is in book two of uh, the Aeneid, we have this Greek named Sinon, uh, pretends to be this uh, escaped captive of the Greeks. He admits that yes, I was a Greek, but the Greeks wanted to sacrifice me to the gods, uh, and uh, not just any of the Greeks, but specifically Ulysses, Odysseus. He, uh, he wants the Trojans to know that he and Odysseus are absolute enemies, uh, that way, he can sort of set himself up as someone who's more honest than those uh, deceitful Greeks because they all know Odysseus, Ulysses is, is, is clever, is a, is a deceiver. So if he wants them to not think the Trojan horse is a deception, he has to distinguish the horse, he has to separate the horse in their minds, in the minds of the Trojans, from Odysseus, Ulysses. But of course that itself is a lie. But the way Aeneas tells the story, and of course the way uh, Virgil narrates it, uh, establishes that the reason this lie worked wasn't so much because uh, the Trojans and the Greeks were competing to see who's more crafty, it's because the Trojans weren't crafty at all. They themselves were honest, uh, they, they sympathized with this man, uh, and because they were honest, they tend to uh, be easy to dupe. Uh, they tend to presume other people are honest as well, and that was their vice. And despite being deceived by Sinon and having their whole uh, city destroyed because of this lie from this Greek who pretended to be in distress but wasn't actually in distress. Notice that when they get to Polyphemus, they again meet uh, a, a stranded Greek who admits that he is Greek, admi admits he is Ithacan, he's one of Odysseus's men, and yet they still trust him, they still give him the benefit of the doubt. Because over and over again, no matter how many times they're deceived, they're the honorable ones, they're the, the upright, the trustworthy ones. They have pietas as a virtue, not matis. And Matus is one sort of vice that uh, Virgil contrasts with Pietas. But there's another vice that becomes a central theme as well, and that is the vice of furor. Now obviously this is where we get our word fury. Uh, we have a furor as in this emotional, uh, overwhelming, usually rage, wrath. But furor isn't just anger in Latin, it's also love. It's, it's any emotion that overwhelms your better judgment. Uh, that overwhelms logic, reason, uh, in especially commitment or uh, duty or pietas. So furor is always threatening to overwhelm pietas, to cause you to forget your pietas, to forget your duties. Shortly after, in the very first book, when uh, Virgil uh, gives the invocation of the muse, uh, he describes Pius Aeneas, you know, duty bound Aeneas, and then contrasts that description with the second character he describes, which is Juno. He asks, you know, how could such a divine wrath uh, be so uh, implacable? As soon as, uh, on the very first page, this is page 47 in the Fagel's translation, uh, the very opening of book one, Virgil asked the muse, uh, tell me how it all began. Why was Juno outraged? What could wound the queen of the gods with all her power? Why did she force a man so famous for his devotion, his pietas, to brave such rounds of hardship, bear such trials? Can such rage, furor, inflame the immortals' hearts? It's Juno's rage, it's Juno's wrath uh, as furor that is consistently persecuting uh, Aeneas. And Virgil wants to ask, why would someone who shows nothing but pietas be the object of such furor? And of course it's not only Juno, it's also Dido. It's going to be Dido's rage, Dido, Dido's anger, uh, her, which is not the rage in itself, 
uh, that's the problem, but the fact that the rage comes from love, spurned love, what she believes is spurned love. So the love and the rage are both uh, examples of furor. And that back and forth, that competition between Pietas and furor is something Aeneas himself has to deal with. He has to choose between his desire to stay with Dido and his Pietas, his duty to go on to Italy. And in Dido, we have a very interesting character. She is not a sort of a flat, uh, static character, uh, the way she might have been represented if someone like Hesiod had uh, described her. Uh, as I mentioned before, sh there is a story about Dido that was around uh, in Virgil's time. So he is adapting a character from the oral tradition that has been described in at least one other written source. But in those sources, she was a queen of Tyre, of the Phoenician city of Tyre, on uh, the Mediterranean, eastern Mediterranean coast in the modern areas of uh, Syria and Lebanon. And she has to flee her brother and settles a new uh, city uh, at Carthage. Now this is probably an ideology uh, of the city of Carthage because the city of Carthage had been founded as one of these many, many colonies of the Phoenicians around the southern Mediterranean. Uh, so it was most likely just a, a trading post that became more profitable. But her story, if it's an ideology, recalls the fact that the Carthaginians were Phoenician. And she, like Aeneas, was a founder uh, of a new city who fled an old city for, uh, for different reasons. Uh, so there's a lot of parallels between Dido and Aeneas. She, is, she has her own sort of heroic character there already. But of course, that story by itself wouldn't suit uh, Virgil's entire purpose. Recall that Virgil's purpose is to explain Rome, not just mention, oh, here's a story about Aeneas who, you know, at some point probably uh, becomes a founder of the Roman people. He wants to use these stories adapted from the, the epic cycle to explain things that happen much later. Uh, so in particular, Dido is not just any queen that gives assistance to Aeneas, she is the queen of Carthage. And for the entire uh, time of the Punic Wars, uh, the wars that involved uh, Hannibal of, uh, and the invasion of Italy, uh, these uh, wars that last nearly a century, uh, in Dido, Virgil wants to give another ideology, not just of Rome in general, but specifically of the Punic Wars. So we see these characters interacting with each other. We can understand why Aeneas needs help. Uh, Dido is willing to help him. Uh, Aeneas tells his story and of course uh, Venus sends Cupid to uh, sit on Dido's lap to make her fall in love with uh, Aeneas. So we, we can see all these reasons why Dido would fall in love with Aeneas and we understand why Aeneas has to leave uh, to, to go on to found this new uh, people. Uh, and we see why uh, Dido is confused by that and, and believes that she's being spurned and her rage against him. But all of these things are being arranged by the writer's goal. And the writer's goal is to set up an antipathy, a, a hatred between Carthage and Rome, and say that that will eventually be the origins of the, the Punic Wars centuries later. And we recognize a, an easy to understand story of love gone bad. And it's not just Dido and Aeneas that are uh, interacting here that are part of the story. It's also the goddess of uh, romantic love, that is Venus, versus the goddess of marriage and state power. Uh, this goddess, Juno, is the one who should be the protector of marriage and should be the protector of state power, and she is the patroness of Dido and of Carthage. Uh, the Carthaginians are said to have a, a particular uh, fondness and a particular altar uh, reserved for Juno. And so this is one of Juno's favored cities. And of course, Aeneas is uh, protected by Venus because you know he is her son. And we may say that we have this uh, familiar parable about uh, a guy who wants a short-term romantic relationship and uh, a woman who wants a marriage and believes that you know there is a marriage that the uh, the man doesn't uh, see as valid. Uh, and so we see a, a a lot of stories and a lot of themes converging in this representation. Um, this representation, this uh, mosaic is uh, from uh, the United Kingdom, from Britain, and was uh, constructed you know, after uh, Britain had become a Roman province, which it was not in Virgil's time, it had not yet been conquered. Uh, 
but in it we see a clear representation of the arrival of the Trojans, followed by the meeting between Aeneas and Dido with Anna and Ascanius there as well. Uh, there's the, the hunting trip where uh, Aeneas and the Trojans as well as Dido go off on this hunting trip and they're uh, trapped in a cave during a storm. Of course all of this was arranged by the, the goddesses, uh, both uh, Hera or Juno and Venus uh, were complicit in bringing them together but both goddesses had very different uh, plans for what that would lead to. And we see of course that Venus has been using Dido this entire time just to provide uh, help to Aeneas, just so that her son has uh, a safe harbor to uh, to rest in and, and restock before he goes on to uh, Rome uh, or to uh, to Italy. So Venus, the goddess of love, is clearly willing to exploit Dido. Uh, Juno recognizes this and she catches Venus in the act. She sees her using uh, Cupid to. Uh, seduce uh, Dido on behalf of Aeneas, uh, just so that she will be uh, cooperative and help the Trojans. And after Juno catches her, she's understandably in indignant and she uh, wants to make a sort of a truce, it seems, with Venus by saying, well, let's keep Aeneas here in Carthage uh, and that way we both win. Uh, I don't have to, Juno gets something that is, uh, her city, uh, Carthage, now has like a new uh, army that's going to protect it. Uh, her favored queen, Dido, now has uh, a husband that will help secure her position there uh, in this new settlement. And Venus gets to uh, see her son uh, prosper in this new uh, role as a king of this uh, foreign city. But notice how the mind games start at that point, even between the goddesses. So in book four, around line 112, uh, and that's page 130 and 131 in the Fagel's translation, we see the goddesses confronting each other and agreeing to, uh, you know, Juno says, I'll bind them in lasting marriage, make them one, their wedding it will be. And while she does this, uh, we're told that Venus did not oppose her, she nodded in assent and smiled at the guile that she saw through. But we notice we haven't actually seen guile. We can't tell that Juno is actually lying here. It seems that uh, this would actually be to her benefit. But clearly Venus is uh, not is going to pretend to go along with it, but uh, she's going to deceive her. While Aeneas and Dido are on this uh, hunting ex expedition together, uh, Juno sends a storm. Dido, and this is uh, on page 133 around line, uh, 205. Uh, Dido and Troy's commander make their way to the same cave for shelter during the storm. Primordial Earth and Juno, queen of marriage, give the signal and lightning torches flare and the high sky bears witness to the wedding. Nymphs on the mountaintops wail out the wedding hymn. This was the first day of her death, the first of grief, uh, the cause of it all. From now on, Dido cares no more for appearances nor for her reputation either. She no longer thinks to keep the affair a secret. No, she calls it marriage, using a word to cloak her sense of guilt. So this reference to torches, this reference to wedding hymns, uh, this is a sort of supernatural wedding that Juno puts on that Dido sees, but Aeneas does not. And so later when she calls this a marriage to, to Aeneas, uh, Aeneas will say, I never held the wedding torch. Uh, because he doesn't understand this as a wedding, though, Di though Dido does. And the confusion certainly grows exponentially from there. And in order to understand what's happening with Dido, we have to really get inside her head and use theory of mind, not only to understand what she's thinking, but what she thinks other people think. Uh, because that's going to be the key that sort of pushes her over the edge, not just the way she thinks things have happened, but what she thinks Aeneas thinks, and also what she thinks the others think, because uh, she has to contend with the local king, Iribus, who uh, courted her, wanted to marry her. And she'd been putting him off and putting off other uh, African kings that uh, had uh, proposed to her. Uh, because up until now, she has said that she swore a vow of uh, a chastity after her husband, Sicius, uh, was uh, killed in Tyre, uh, she's never going to marry again. 
but now she is telling people that she is married to Aeneas. Uh, so that puts her in a very precarious situation that she can only uh, defend herself now against the potential uh, attacks from Iribus if Aeneas is and his Trojans are actually going to be the, the military defense of Carthage. But she quickly finds out that that's not going to happen and she finds out because Aeneas is preparing the boats uh, to leave Carthage. And we know why he's preparing the boats because Mercury has come to him, uh, been sent by Zeus to remind him that this is not the place you're supposed to settle. This is not the kingdom you're supposed to found. And all of this is made very explicit to us uh, between lines 300 and 350, uh, which is on page 136 to 137 when Mercury goes to him and tells him to at least remember Ascanius rising into his prime, the hopes uh, you lodge in Eulus, who is Ascanius, your only heir. You owe him Italy's realm, the land of Rome. Uh, and so reminding him that you owe your son, you owe your descendants this new kingdom that is not here, is not Carthage, that you're giving up by staying here in Carthage. And so at that point we're told that uh, Aeneas yearns to be gone, to desert this land he loves, thunderstruck by the warnings, Jupiter's command. Probing his options, turning to this plan and that, in other words, he's doing what uh, Odysseus did as Metis. I'm thinking about this plan and that plan and this plan, but ultimately it's not the planning that he's supposed to give into, it's his pietas, his duty. Uh, but he has to make a decision at this point between love, that is furor, and uh, pietas, that is duty, and the duty to go on and found uh, this new place. And so he thinks that the best course of action is to go ahead and start readying the ships, but then he will approach Dido and tell her. But of course, as the ships are being prepared, she finds out and she thinks he was trying to sneak away. So on page 138, this is line, uh, before line 378, she calls him, you traitor. You really believed you'd keep this secret, this outrage. Uh, can nothing hold you back, not our love, not the pledge once sealed with our right hands, in other words, this marriage. Uh, not even the thought of Dido doomed to a cruel death. Uh, presumably at this point it's not her suicide that she's making reference to, but the fact that uh, she has angered these other local kings uh, by not marrying them and yet marrying uh, Aeneas. Oh, I pray by these tears, by the faith in your right hand, what else have I left myself uh, in all my pain? By our wedding vows, the marriage we began. Uh, thanks to you, my sense of honor is gone, my one and only pathway to the stars, the renown I once hold dear, uh, in whose hands, my guest, did you leave me here to meet my death? Guest, that's all that remains of husband now. So again, remember our marriage, uh, now that you're just a guest and no longer my husband. Uh, you know, this is the position you put me in by this false marriage. But Aeneas is clearly caught off guard by this. He says, uh, even though he's, we're told he's fighting to master the torment in his heart, in other words, the furor in his heart. Uh, at last, he ventured a few words. I, you have done me so many kindnesses and you can count them all. I shall never deny what you deserve, my queen, never regret my memories of Dido, not while I can recall myself and draw breath of life. And he says that he, I never did I dream that I'd keep my flight a secret, don't imagine that. But then he counters, nor did I once extend a bridegroom's torch or enter into a marriage pact with you. I, so he's saying, okay, you don't deserve this and I wasn't going to keep it a secret, but we are not married. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, because this supernatural arrangement that uh, Juno had uh, established is something that Dido saw, but Aeneas did not see when they were in the cave. Uh, and then his next line is rather unfortunate, and this is not a very good uh, theory of mine action. Uh, he says, if the fates had left me free to live my life, to arrange my own affairs of my own free will, Troy is the city, first of all, that I'd safeguard. Uh, in other words, I'd still be home with Creusa, and I would never would have uh, met you. Now, we can understand this from his point of view. Uh, he's lost a lot, and whatever he loses at Carthage is nothing compared to what he's lost when he lost his wife and, and his uh, uh, city. But clearly this is not the right time to confront Dido with that. And after this, although we see that it's clearly difficult for Aeneas to break himself away from this relationship and from this place, uh, he is Aeneas duty bound, uh, Pias Aeneas. Uh, that's line 495 uh, reminds us of that. But Aeneas is driven by duty now. Strongly he lo longs to ease and allay her sorrow, speak to her, turn away her anguish with reassurance. Still, moaning deeply, heart shattered by his great love, in spite of all, 
he obeys the God's commands, and back he goes to his ships. And we get the implication that for all his praise of Pietas, Virgil does sympathize with Dido. Uh, around line 518, he says, love, talking to uh, Cupid, uh, love, you tyrant, to what extremes won't you compel our hearts? But it's how the characters respond to that love that distinguishes uh, the furor of Dido uh, that ultimately wins versus the pietas of Aeneas. Uh, we get this great Homeric simile uh, around line 555. As firm as a sturdy oak grown tough with age when the north winds blasting off the Alps compete, fighting left and right to wrench it from the earth and the winds scream and the trunk shudders, its leafy crest showers across the ground but it clings firm to its rock, its roots stretching as deep into a dark world below as, it cr as its crowns go towering toward the gales of the heaven. So firm the hero stands, buffeted left and right by storms of appeals. He takes the full force of love and suffering deep into his great heart. His will stands unmoved, the falling tears are futile. In other words, Aeneas is just as, uh, has just as much furor inside him, but his will overwhelms the furor, and his will is committed to pietas, uh, rather than emotion. And so it seems that Virgil is rather ambiguous on where he falls in this judgment of, of Dido. Uh, is this, uh, does she just lack the pietas that she needs? And we had seen before that when she uh, falls in love with Aeneas while he's uh, explaining the, the story, while he's telling the story of the escape from Troy and his adventures on the sea, uh, we were told at the beginning of book four that the construction of Carthage had stopped. Uh, in other words, now that she was so fixated on Aeneas, on her love for Aeneas, on her furor, her, her passion, uh, she had neglected her civic duties. And uh, this was a failure of Pietas. Uh, but it's also, uh, Virgil consistently refers to her as infelix dido. That means unfortunate, uh, and that word felix uh, is sometimes translated as happy, and so sometimes infelix will be translated as unhappy. But it's not just happy and it's not just fortunate, it is fated. Uh, infelix is also ill-fated. Uh, in fact, our word happy comes from uh, happen, uh, the, the same uh, root word is the word happen, like uh, what's going to happen, what is fated, we don't know, and if it turns out to be good, then you are happy. Uh, but if you are unfated or p badly fated, you are unhappy. Uh, slightly different than the way we use the term now, but we have the same ambiguity in Infelix Dido. Is she fated to be unhappy? Is she fated, is her life tragic? because of something that is beyond her control, or is this the result of her inability to restrain her furor? Could she have shown more pietas to Carthage and come up with some way to go on as its uh, leader? Uh, it's definitely made explicit that she was not fated to die. Uh, this is why when she commits suicide, uh, Juno has to cut off a, a lock of her hair, or Juno has to send Iris, the goddess, the messenger goddess, to cut off a lock of her hair in order to give to Persephone so that she can enter the underworld because she, Dido was not fated to die yet. Dido took her own life in this moment of furor, uh, of overwhelming passion. But all of this, again, we remember, serves a purpose for Virgil. In book four, as she's committing suicide, she's created this pyre where instead of making sacrifices to the gods, as in the older story, she's burning all of Aeneas's uh, weapons and clothes and things that he's left behind in their bedroom. And she's pretending that that's all she's burning, but she plans to uh, fall on her sword and uh, die there on the, the pyre as well. But as she does, she makes it a, a ritual. She makes it a, an invocation of this curse. Uh, so she's not just sacrificing an animal and saying, I hope uh, you gods that to whom I make the sacrifice will cause this thing to happen that I want to happen. But she's making herself the sacrifice and using that to consecrate a curse. And that curse is against the descendants of Aeneas. Uh, she says around line 775, that is my prayer, my final cry. I pour it out with my own life blood. And you, my Tyrians, in other words, people from Tyre, because even though they're no longer in Tyre, uh, they're from the city of Tyre in Phoenicia. You, my Tyrians, hairy with hatred, all his line, his race to come. Make that offering to my ashes, send it down below. No love between our peoples, ever, no pacts of peace. 
Come rising up from my bones, you avengers still unknown, to stalk these Trojan settlers. Hunt with fire and iron now or in time to come, whenever the power is yours. Shore clash with shore, sea against sea, and sword against sword. This is my curse, war between all our peoples, all our children, endless war. So clearly this is, this connection between Dido and Aeneas, uh, even though each character had their own story before Virgil, Virgil's putting them together and he's not just putting them together to make an interesting story, he is directly telling us this is why Hannibal Barca existed. This is why the Punic Wars happened. Uh, and it's clear that he's not really coming up with an explanation he might believe, but this is a, a founding myth of the Republic, not just the Republic as it is at the moment that uh, Virgil is alive, but as uh, it has come to be through all of these events, including the Punic Wars. But we don't want to fall too much into that historicizing. We, uh, we should also be able to let Dido be Dido and let Aeneas be Aeneas. Now, so we keep in mind the author's goal uh, and the author's decisions and how they affect the narration. But we as readers still have this option to follow the story uh, and sort of construct that story in our own minds disconnected from the narrative. Uh, so we can find a lot going on, we can find a lot of really interesting uh, character analysis and uh, commentary on how uh, emotion and duty uh, fight each other differently in different types of personalities. We can see a lot of this happening in these characters. Uh, we don't necessarily have to let Virgil rush to this uh, historical ideology. After leaving Carthage, of course, Aeneas and the Trojans go first to Eryx, and this is where they have the funeral games for Anchises. It's been one year uh, since they buried Anchises there at Drepanum, uh, both on the western end of Sicily. There's quite a bit that happens there, more with the author's goal. Uh, remember that the Trojan women, because they're inflamed by Iris, who's in disguise, uh, who tells them, let's stop uh, wandering the seas, let's just settle down here. Uh, Eryx has the, uh, the the Trojan king, Acestes, there to uh, give them a, a place to stay, and the women are inflamed to burn the ships, or the, the women are driven in a furor to burn the Trojan ships so that they can stay there, so that they don't have to keep sailing from one place to the to the next, and we can kind of uh, uh, identify with them at this point, we can sympathize with them, uh, because it seems like every time they get to a new place, uh, they settle down for a little bit, but then they have to pick up and, and leave again. But of course, the author's goal at this point is he needs to get rid of the, the female Trojans, because all the other Trojan men, once they arrive in uh, Italy, they're going to have to take Latin wives, so something has to happen, and this sort of serves nicely to reinforce the theme that uh, pietas means consistently having to give up this comfort, uh, and that is uh, reconciled, is easily sort of, uh, fits in with uh, the, the author's goal of creating this ideology of Rome, in which these Latin, or these Trojan men arrive in Italy and uh, take local wives and give birth to the Roman people. And then on from there, uh, of course, they go to the underworld. Just like Odysseus and Heracles, or Hercules, and Orpheus and Theseus, uh, Aeneas, to be an epic hero, has to go to the underworld. And this is uh, It's a very interesting book because it's not entirely necessary in the plot. He can find out the same information uh, if, he, if his father's ghost visited him again, or if Venus uh, revealed in a supernatural vision uh, the, the future of Rome, uh, the way she revealed the, the fact that the gods were destroying Troy. But, if Odysseus did it, then Aeneas is gonna have to do it and, and do it better in, in Virgil. Uh, the interest to the underworld is one of those places that Virgil did scout out himself. It's, uh, this is a, a new twist, whereas instead of having to go beyond the Pillars of Hercules, which is beyond the Straits of Gibraltar, uh, the uh, narrowest point between uh, Spain and North Africa, uh, and out into the Atlantic Ocean, where, which is where uh, frequently the realm of the dead is. It's on an island out in the Atlantic somewhere. Uh, in this case, it's a an actual cave, a cave that existed in Virgil's time and you can still visit it today, a cave that goes to this underground lake called the Lake of Avernus, and Virgil is drawing the entrance to the underworld a little bit closer uh, to the, the path that is laid out in front of Aeneas. And another new development that Virgil adds 
to underworld mythology is the, the punishment of crimes in the afterlife. Uh, the Greeks portrayed certain people as being punished in the underworld in, in Tartarus, but these were usually only the people who incurred particular wrath of particular gods. So like Prometheus uh, incurs the wrath of Zeus, and so he is singled out for torture. Uh, but in Virgil, we have our first glimpse of the use of the underworld as a place of judgment that's modeled on like civic law courts. Uh, and the Christian idea of hell had not been developed yet. Uh, at least hell as a place of eternal torment for specific sins or specific crimes. Uh, a century later when the New Testament was written, the word that is translated as hell in English uh, translations was actually Gehenna. And that was the name of a trash dump on the southern end of Jerusalem, uh, which is still a valley there. You can go see hell, you can see Gehenna. Uh, but this is just where uh, people threw their trash away and there was always a fire burning there because there was always trash that was uh, being burned. And this becomes used in the Gospel of Matthew and Mark, uh, where it's, Gehenna is used as sort of a metaphor for the total destruction of the body and the soul. Uh, rather than just being killed and still sort of like having a body to be buried, you're, you're completely obliterated to where you no longer exist, as if you were thrown into these giant fires uh, on the south end of town at Gehenna. Uh, it's, it's that rather than an otherworldly location where souls are punished for all eternity. And the idea we now tend to have of hell is a place where uh, particular crimes done in life are punished with particular otherworldly punishments comes from the first part of Dante Alighieri's uh, medieval uh, poem, The Commedia, uh, which we usually translate as a divine comedy. Uh, specifically, the first part is uh, The Inferno. Uh, and in this, Dante directly models his depiction of hell on book six of Virgil's Aeneid. And he wasn't vague about this. He actually has Virgil as a character in the, the story, and he, Virgil is Dante's tour guide uh, through hell, and he takes him through the nine levels of hell, and he points out, here are these people who did this in life, and that's why they're being punished with this particular punishment uh, in hell. And uh, incidentally, uh, Ulysses and, or Odysseus and Diomedes are both being tormented in hell for eternity because of the, uh, the sack of Troy. Uh, that contempt for Ulysses, especially Ulysses as a liar, as a deceiver, is something that uh, Dante will later pick up from uh, Virgil. But the real writer's goal for book six in the journey to hell seems to be the introduction of uh, Rome. Some way to take two things that happen a thousand years, more than a thousand years apart, that is the aftermath of the Trojan War, which you know, even by the, the standards that the ancients uh, configured, uh, even by the the classical chronology, uh, starting with fifth century Athens, they figured that somewhere around 1170, 1180 is when the Trojan War would have been. So Virgil has to connect that with his own time, and how's he gonna do that? Uh, well, this is why he has to go see his father in the underworld. Uh, he has to go there not just to see his father, he has to go there in order so that Virgil can say this is Aeneas as the founder of Rome, even though Rome won't be founded for another uh, several centuries after Aeneas' lifetime. And we've already seen in book one uh, sort of a prophecy of uh, what Rome will eventually be, the reference specifically to Augustus Caesar when Venus asks Jupiter uh, what's going to happen to the Trojans? And Jupiter goes on a long description of, you know, he's going to give birth to this lion and they're gonna found Rome. So uh, right from the beginning, Virgil is very explicit that this is not just about Aeneas, this is about Rome. But it becomes all the more about Rome in toward the end of book six. So line 823 of book six is on page 206 in the Fagel's translation. Uh, and Chises points to these spirits in the underworld and says, they're the spirits owed a second body by the fates. They drink deep of river, river Lethe's currents there. Remember that Lethe is the river of forgetfulness. Uh, Palinurus, when the god of sleep put him to sleep, he had water from the river Lethe. It's forgetfulness. Uh, so they're gonna have to forget their past lives in order to begin uh, the lives that they're uh, fated to come back into in the future. And he says, I count the tally out of all my children's children. So these are his uh, descendants, and of course, uh, Aeneas' descendants. And Virgil has Anchises go through some of the more famous uh, figures from Roman history, including Romulus around line uh, 897. Uh, and Caesar, and it's ambiguous sometimes when uh, Virgil uses the name Caesar if he's talking about Julius Caesar or Caesar Augustus, but specifically Caesar Augustus around line 
9.14. Uh, the son of a god, he will bring back the age of gold. Uh, so keep in mind, uh, Julius Caesar had been deified uh, after his death, or declared a god. And we don't only get descriptions of these future Romans, but also Anchises kind of breaks the fourth wall and talks directly to the audience uh, after recounting uh, who these people are that are passing in front of him, all names that the audience will be familiar with. He says around line 976, others I have no doubt will forge the bronze to breathe with suppler lines, draw from the block of marble features quick with life, plead their cases better, chart with their rods the stars that climb the sky and foretell the times they rise. But you, Roman, remember, rule with all your power the peoples of the earth. These will be your arts, to put your stamp on the works and ways of peace, to spare the defeated and break the proud in war. And so he's giving a mission statement that is completely out of anything that has reference to the story that uh, the Aeneid is telling, but it's part of the narrative because it's something that the author uh, wants the, the reader to, it's a connection the author wants the reader to make. And it's a justification not only of uh, Rome's power in the world, but also of the new hierarchy at which this very first Roman emperor, Augustus, is not the bad guy, is not the tyrant, is not the, the threat that people were afraid Julius Caesar would be, even though he clearly is. Even though the, the Senate and the people of Rome are no longer in control of Rome, it's now all a complete, uh, it's all dependent on the arbitrary will of one individual human being. Uh, Virgil has to craft this depiction where all of this uh, auctoritas, this authority, uh, and the, the pietas demanded of each individual member of that uh, social hierarchy all goes toward the greater good of peace. But of course, as he says, to get that peace, you should be good to those you defeat, but you should break the proud, break the arrogant with war. So war is a good thing because it will bring peace. But uh, you're only supposed to be good to the people that you've already defeated. And of course, by Virgil's time, uh, quite a few proud people had been broken in war. Uh, from Hispania on the Iberian Peninsula on the western end of the Mediterranean, all the way to Mesopotamia. Uh, and of course, uh, North Africa and all of Greece and Asia Minor and as well as up into Gaul. And uh, in the, the decades that would follow Virgil, they would move all the way into, uh, onto the island of Britain. But we see Virgil's goal of tying all of this conquest into this much more ancient story. Uh, because otherwise we would have the descendants of Romulus, these uh, criminals who uh, created their first, uh, founded their city based on kidnapping unwilling wives, uh, you know, you could easily create a story about the Roman Empire as being the descendant of that group, in which case they're just, you know, pillaging the entire world. They're just these aggressors, these, uh, they're still the criminals that are attacking other people and taking whatever they want. And that would be just as easy to validate uh, with the, uh, the historical record. But Virgil wants to give Rome a more noble uh, background story, a more noble ideology, as a means to giving it a, a more noble identity in the present. Even though they are conquerors, they are peacekeepers. Uh, even though they use military force to uh, take control over other lands, they're doing it for the, uh, those other lands' own good. Uh, they're these very paternalistic protectors. And so with the Aeneid, we have a very clear and a very deliberate uh, narrativization of history, uh, as we've discussed from the, the very beginning. We never just tell all of history, all of these natural phenomena, economic phenomena. Uh, we don't uh, say, well, all of this was because these trade routes were very important to this, this group. Uh, we have to simplify that narrative and do it in such a way that meets the needs of the present. The present identity group, which in Virgil's case would be Imperial Rome, even though the Republic's destroyed uh, even though the Republic has been replaced with uh, a imperial hierarchy, uh, he still wants to create this version of history that 
creates a very clear beginning for the Roman people that's not the beginning with Romulus. It's a, a more distant beginning, a more cultured beginning because you know the Trojan War is, is a story that was the focus of Greek culture which even the Romans at, in Virgil's time saw as, as more uh, elevated, more, more complicated, uh, more cultured uh, than they are themselves. But it connects to this older, grander, and more noble idea because where you start the story has a lot to do with how you uh, view the end or view the present. And of course, obviously with book six, Virgil extends the end of the story uh, more than a millennium into the future by having Anchises show Aeneas the soul that will become Augustus Caesar. Uh, he's not only moved the beginning of the Roman story back more than a thousand years, he's also extended the Trojan War forward in history more than a thousand years to his own present and for the sake of edifying his own present. 